This is Dr. Carl Dizeroth. He's one of, if not the world's leading experts in the field of psychiatry. He's a professor and an MD at Stanford, and he invented a way to use bacteria and algae to monitor and even control the brain. In this video, I'm gonna walk you through three things that I learned from his new book, Projections, A Story of Human Emotion. So I was really excited about this one because about a year ago, I decided to go back to school to study medicine and my goal is to specialize in psychiatry. From what I've seen, there aren't very many books like this one that give you a first-hand account of what it's like to actually be a psychiatrist. It's an underdocumented specialty, but to me, it's the most interesting because it has the most unexplored territory. And I can't imagine a better place to start for somebody who wants to get a glimpse of what working in this field is actually like. Carl has this incredibly entertaining style of writing that blends together real hard science with literature in a really unique way. Every chapter focuses on a specific disease and each one starts with a piece of poetry or a quote that frames the context for that disease. Everything from Milton's Paradise Lost to James Joyce, Wallace Stevens, it's a really refreshing approach to these subjects that can get pretty dry and pretty technical. Even the way he started the book, from the opening paragraph, I was all in. In the art of weaving, warp threads are structural and strong and anchored at the origin, creating a frame for crossing fibers as the fabric is woven. Warp threads bridge the formed past to the ragged present to the yet featureless future. The tapestry of the human story has its own warp threads rooted deep in the gorges of East Africa. The inner workings of the mind give form to these threads, creating a framework within us upon which the story of each individual can come into being. This was so great, especially since I'm coming from a background in textiles and apparel design. The metaphor here just resonated with me on so many levels. And he also takes the opening prologue as an opportunity to explain optogenetics. Optogenetics is a technique that he invented to study brain activity. And I could sit here and try to explain it to you, but I don't want to butcher it. So I'd rather let him explain it. One of the many things you're known for, one of the, one of the big things is called optogenetics. What is it? So we take genes, bits of DNA from microbes, single-celled organisms. And these single-celled organisms like algae, they uh, make... Uh, little proteins that sit in the surface of their cells that receive light, capture a photon of light, and open up a little hole in the membrane of the cell and let charged particles, ions like sodium and potassium, flow across the membrane of the cell. And that, they, these algae and bacteria, they do this for their own reasons because that helps them move, it helps them make and use energy. But that's a beautiful thing for neuroscience because movement of ions, charged particles across the membrane of the cell is exactly the kind of electricity that neurons work with. So if we can take this bit of DNA that encodes this beautiful protein that turns light into electricity from algae, and if we can put it into some neurons, but not other neurons, which we can do using genetic tricks, then you've got a situation, then you can shine on the light and only the cells that have the gene and that are expressing the gene will be the initial direct uh, cells that are activated by the light. So I wanna break down three things that I learned from the stories in this book. The first takeaway is you can't connect all of the dots looking forward in life. The first chapter is called Storehouse of Tears and it tells the stories of two very different patients that Dizeroth treated years apart from each other. The first patient, is a young man who loses his pregnant wife in a car accident where he was the driver and he's looking for help because he lost the ability to cry. He doesn't feel anything anymore after that loss, in fact, and he doesn't know what to do. The other patient is a little girl named Andy who comes in for a checkup because she's experiencing some minor trouble with double vision 
which turns out unfortunately to be a brain tumor. And this really hits Dizeroth hard. Actually, it almost breaks him. He said that at the time, he just felt like he couldn't do it anymore. He couldn't live that way. He couldn't last in medicine in this field where he would have to do this over and over again for the rest of his life. But he kept going. And years later, a connection formed in his mind between this little girl and this young man. The link between these two wasn't very obvious initially, but it turned out that both patients were suffering from a common cause in a region of the brain known as the pons. And he used that connection between these patients and those painful memories from seeing them suffer to drive him. See, life is gonna test you with these valleys that you have to make your way through. And it may not be clear why things happen the way that they do when they're happening at the time, but when you look back on them, you can start to piece them together and get to the meaning of things. You can string together these experiences and as a doctor, you can use that as fuel to try to find answers and ultimately to discover new treatments. The next big takeaway that I want to share came in a chapter called Consummation, which tells a really tough story about a girl who's suffering from bulimia and anorexia. This young lady was excusing herself from the classroom quite often throughout the day, and people started to catch on to the fact that something might be wrong. And it even got to the point where she couldn't go to class at all, and no one knew what was happening, what was wrong, so her family brought her in. But she wasn't ready just yet to come out with it and share this burden that she had been struggling with for so long. And this is the point that Dizeroth made that really stuck with me. He pointed out how important it is in these situations to let the patient declare themselves in their own words and being mindful not to pre-frame the issue in a way that you're stripping away this person's agency by not allowing them to take ownership of their struggle in their own time. I thought that was spectacular advice. He started out the chapter with this passage from Milton's Paradise Lost. Farewell, happy fields where joy ever dwells. Hail horrors, hail infernal world, and thou profoundest hell receive thy new possessor. One who brings a mind not to be changed by place or time. The mind is its own place and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Here at least we shall be free. Better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. Anxiety and bulimia are really interesting because they almost take on a personhood of their own within the patient. Eating disorders account for the highest death rate of any psychiatric illness. When I read that, I was amazed. It's like a part of that person seizes control from the inside and refuses to let go until they've taken away everything from them. It's a terrible disease, but the redeeming power of listening is what I took away from that story. My third takeaway from this book was a simple observation, but it completely changed the way that I look at studying and learning now. And the takeaway is to optimize what you're learning to fit your specific operating system. Now, what does that mean? So one of the things that I liked most about the book was the way that Dr. Dizeroth poeticized the science that he was communicating. These small oxygen burners become our mitochondria, energy factories for each cell, so ancient in origin that they use a different dialect of life's DNA code. They have kept their mother tongue for private use over billions of years of living together with us. That's such a unique and subtle way of putting that into context. And I'll remember that about mitochondria forever because of the way that he wrote it. Rendering information in a format that works for you is the best way to make it stick now, when I'm studying for the MCAT or if there's a concept that I'm having trouble with, I can use that method as a tool to shape and mold the information 
in a way that works for the way that my brain remembers things. There's also this chapter where he writes a story from the perspective of a patient who's been diagnosed with psychosis, which is really well done. It's very interesting. You have to read it for yourself to find out what happens, but I just thought I'd mention it because it's really, really an interesting part of the book. So if you're interested in mental health and you want to learn more about the field of psychiatry, this is a great book to read. I'd love to interview Dr. Dyseroth someday and get to dig into some of the questions that I have about his work and the future of the field. I highly recommend the book. There's a link in the description if you want to get a copy. And if you like that quote from Milton's Paradise Lost, I made a review of that book that I'd like you to watch. You can find that video right here. Thank you for your attention, everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.